my work is to bring people together to break bread and spark social change. We've dedicated the dinner table to ending the horrors of genocide, the Israel-Palestine conflict. We've talked about God, the future of agriculture. We've even talked about the history of hip-hop. These dinners have resulted in action, to be sure. But the most powerful thing they create is deep engagement and profound relationships. And I strongly believe that relationships create velocity. If we want our ideas, these ideas worth spreading, to move with power and swiftness through the world, the depth of our personal relationships equals the speed of our superhighway. I imagine the table as a great magnet that draws us together, holds us in an embrace, and then releases us back into the world. The table and fire are also where we first concentrated calories by cooking. It's where we as a species made a massive evolutionary exchange, trading these big bellies and these small brains for very large brains and small bellies. It's the missing link between human and ape. Um, it also started this amazing tradition of the table shaping culture. Voltaire and Diderot had their most illuminating moments at dinners in salons. Benjamin Franklin and J.B. Priestley helped spark the Industrial Revolution with their table ruminations. The birth of modern art, we, we can thank a lot to, to Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas, while in their salons they were serving, among other things, cannabis fudge. <laughs> and even though alcohol and cigars were often the main course, um, James Watson and his Los Angeles gatherings of the Thai Club brought us the double helix. But what does the table have to do with medicine and the state of our healthcare system and being on this stage? So that begins on a spectacular summer morning. I was on a train going between Portland and Seattle. Um, the tracks were following the beautiful, beautiful Lower Puget Sound, um, and I was immersed in a conversation with two strangers. Both of them were doctors. One of them involved in concierge medicine, and the other had just left a practice, a family practice. She was on a one-year walkabout um, in search of what it really means to be a healer, feeling pretty beat up by the current medical system. So this impromptu conversation in the dining car over a table prompted two, revealed to me two devastating statistics. The first one was that the vast majority of American bankruptcies are related to end-of-life expense. That hit me like a total blow to the gut. What came next? Slap to the face. 75% of Americans want to die at home, yet only 25% of them do. For a layperson, that was just outrageous and shocking. As the train rolled along, this outrage sparked a memory. I was thrown back to being 10 years old. My father lived in a nursing home, having recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I didn't like visiting him there. We didn't know how to talk about death and illness in my family, and so denial was often the route we chose. Two years later, when I was 12, I woke up in the middle of the night. I had a strong sense that I was awake for a reason, but I didn't know what it was. And I looked at my alarm clock, and the time was 3.43 a.m. A few hours later, I was to find out that my father's heart had stopped at 3.43 a.m., while I laid awake in bed about 20 miles away. To this day, not spending more time with my father during his final years is one of the only major regrets I have in life. So as the train's rolling into Seattle, outrage, memory, I got inspired. I'm still sitting with the physicians, and I asked them two questions. I said, first, do you agree that how we end our lives is the most important and costly conversation Americans aren't having? They said, absolutely. So I said, secondly, so if I was crazy enough to launch a national campaign called Let's Have Dinner, 
and talk about death? <laughs> Do you think I'd find wide support? Would doctors be interested, hospitals, patients, essentially everyone? They said, absolutely. Both of them grabbed my hands, these are complete strangers, looked me in the eye and said, this must happen. So a couple weeks later, I found myself among my colleagues at the University of Washington, Masters of Communication in Digital Media, and I pitched them the idea. I said, I want to start a large-scale intervention. <laughs> They laughed a little bit. Who, who do you want to have this intervention with, Michael? The country, you know. <laughs> Not a family, but the country. Um, so then they asked, what is the topic of this intervention going to be? I paused, how we die. They didn't laugh that time. There was a stillness in the room, but within a few days they had agreed. And me and Scott Macklin, the associate director of the department, had signed up 12 master's students. And we started designing together, eating together, building this new platform, and really facing our own mortality. At that point, deathoverdinner.org was born. So before, we were talking about romantic train rides and historic feasts and death. Um, and that Harvard statistic that found that 62% of bankruptcies in the U.S. are caused by medical expense. <clears throat> and the leading factor in that is end-of-life expense. Another harrowing statistic emerged this fall, and that was from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And it found that 43% of all Medicare patients spend more than their total assets out of pocket on end-of-life expense. So for me, this was pretty much in my face. And the question was, how do we act on this information? Politicians who urge action have been cast as advocating death panels. As you know, hospitals and insurance companies um, and, and doctors have been stymied by issues of fiduciary responsibility, threat of lawsuit, and the current limitations of the hospice system. So if these metrics were going to change, it became clear to my University of Washington students that what was required was actually a grassroots movement, something that was decentralized and citizen-led. And so we started to imagine a patient-led revolution held at the dinner table. And we chose All Hallows' Eve. <laughs> as an evening to have a very particular kind of death dinner, with perhaps the best drinking game of all time. We filled a goblet full of grappa. Grappa is a drink of a fair amount of gravity. And we, <laughs> and we passed it around the table. Everyone raised the glass, and as they did, they paid tribute to a recent ancestor, a recently passed ancestor, someone that they admired and made major impact on their life. And there were tears, there was laughter, there was anger, there was shock, everything at the table. But the most important thing that we experienced, the most prevalent emotion, was gratitude um, for those people that had come before. And their amazing stories emerged and filled the space. One student, Cynthia Andrews, gave a spirited shout out. She said, I want to raise my glass to Willa Bell Sutton, my grandmother, the strongest bitch that ever lived. And as the laughter subsided, she told us the story about how her grandfather wooed the difficult Willa Bell. Night after night, he'd cook her dinner. And at the end of dinner, he would take a single pearl and roll it across the table to her. And after 40 nights, she had a full necklace, and that's when he proposed marriage. So after Halloween, we were like, how do we turn evenings like this into something wider? Like, where is the social action here? And so we started to imagine a digital framework that would allow people to gather those that are closest to them and, and have this important conversation to consider what we want our final days to be like, who we want near us, 
and how we can support the wishes of those that are closest to us. So we were modest at first. We thought we could maybe reach a couple thousand people. But as we started to reach out to leaders in healthcare, in wellness, even in spirituality, doctors, writers, you name it, entrepreneurs. What we found is this provocation, let's have dinner and talk about death, had hit a resonant chord, a deeply resonant chord. And by Christmas break, only a couple months after we had started, we had already amassed a superstar group of leaders in healthcare and medicine as advisors and partners in the project, many of whom are seated among us today. And at that point, it became abundantly clear. This is a conversation that the entire country needs to be having. And it's starting to look like we have a team in place to not reach just a couple thousand people, but to reach hundreds of thousands of people. Because if the first sensation, the first response is, how morbid? <laughs> Why would I want to stop and talk about death, especially over dinner? <laughs> what happens? is people immediately lean in and they begin sharing, they begin talking. They talk about how beautiful their father's death was or how awful, you know, some other passing for another loved one. We assume that America is afraid of this conversation, but I believe, and I hope you believe, that that's a cultural myth. And I think that the only thing that's necessary is the proper invitation, permission, and guidance. So medical professionals are constantly thinking about how to engage patients in these difficult conversations. But I don't think it can always start with doctors and nurses talking to patients. Um, I think sometimes <clears throat> it needs to happen with ordinary people talking to each other. Hospitals, funeral parlors, um, and insurance offices are really not the only place that we should confront death. The proper depth of that conversation doesn't happen when we're intimidated and overwhelmed and sad. It happens when we're most comfortable, when our guard is down. And the ritual of breaking bread, perhaps with a little addition of wine, can create a space that has warmth and trust and authenticity. <clears throat> the dinner table is absolutely the most forgiving place to have this kind of conversation. Within this context, what seems like a scary or difficult conversation suddenly isn't. It's liberating. It's transformative. It brings us closer together, it reminds us of our humanity, and it leaves us stronger, bolder, and wiser than we were than we sat down. And hopefully, leaves us more prepared for a conversation with our doctor, a difficult one in the future, or, or a conversation with our father's nursing home that we weren't prepared to have. So by midsummer, we're going to launch a beta version of Let's Have Dinner and Talk About Death. And what this is, is an invitation for anyone who's interested to create their own dinner. And it'll lead people through a choose-your-own-adventure um, adventure to gather the people that you want, the people that are closest to you, to select pre-dinner reading materials, <clears throat> to hold conversational prompts and structure, and at the end of it, to provide action items for each person who took part in it. And that would be living wills and advanced directives and petitions to Congress or o organ donorship. And at the end, what it's going to give you is the ability to share about the experience, but also a social media badge that I think is a little funny. It's, I survived a death dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Will it move the needle? I'm not sure. But what our hope is, is to spark the gentlest revolution imaginable. And I say this with total authenticity. I would love everybody in this room to be a partner in this project. So how effective will we be? Obviously, it's going to be told the test of time. Will people actually take the time 
to have these dinners and bring people into their homes or wherever they have it, even if it's at a fast food restaurant. <laughs> After our first dinner, our prototype dinner, Three of my students, independent of the class, and my web developer, after hearing about it, immediately went out and brought their families together, looking their parents directly in the eye and saying, how do you want your final days to be, and how can I be a powerful um, agent in supporting that? So that gave me some real hope. And then on that All Hallows' Eve I mentioned, I was asked to imagine my own final days. And as I began giving a rehearsed response, something that I felt passionate about since I was 17, that went something like, I'm going to die alone, I'm going to slip off into the mountains, um, <laughs> I don't want to be a burden to my family or society. It was about, I was really revving up, I was going to deliver it in a beautiful fashion. I stopped. It wasn't true anymore. <laughs> and I answered, answered much to my surprise, all I want for my final days is to be surrounded by my two loving daughters, August and Violet. And so this simple but crucial question yielded completely new results for me. Looking at death has taught me how to live. Thank you. <laughs>